And now the weekend preview segment brought to you by Three Chimneys. We're going to continue with previewing the Breeders' Cup. We'll take a look now at the Distaff Turf and Breeders' Cup Classic. Race nine on the card is the Breeders' Cup Distaff. I think next to the Classic, this is the second best race of the entire program. This is what this thing is absolutely loaded in here. So many good fillies in here could go a bunch of different ways. Um, a nest is the deserving favorite in here. She's been brilliant uh, ever since running second in the Belmont, running through wins in the Coaching Club, Alabama, and Belgium. Name. But the value in here, and I think Zoe's going to agree with me on this one because I remember what she said in the past. The value is Clarier because she's going to be the forgotten horse based on her race in the personal ensign. If you like Mal at that, how do you not like Clarier? She beat her twice. She beat her in the Ogden Phipps and beat her in the Shoe V. Her race in the personal ensign is a complete Leap throw out. She lost the race at the gate. She was very fractious. She banged her head against the starting gate. It's a complete throw out. Trainer Steve Asmussen, who is as good as it gets, has had all that time to get her ready for this. I think this race is going to be three of them on the wire. It's going to be who gets the best trip. Clarier, Nest, Malathat, uh, search results, no slouch either. Uh, remember, Secret Oath won the Kentucky Oaks, but she hasn't been the same filly in quite some time. Zoe, Clarier, what do you think? I like her. Um, I'm not using her on top. I love Malafat okay. in here, watching her works. I think she's head and shoulders. I love Nest as well, and she's worked very nicely. But Malafat just seems to have come into her own of late. I don't think the one hole is going to hurt her. She won from the one hole last time out, taking the spinster and almost propping at the wire with Johnny V. She did it so easily. So it's going to be Malafat for me. Um, I'm with you on Clarier, but, y you know, Nest is going to run her race. Um, she yeah, horse to beat off numbers. But I think we're forgetting about the other Asmussen in here in society. The daughter, there you go, Randy, the daughter of Gunrunner. She's comfortably drawn on the outside, field of eight. She's got plenty of time to get over. She's fast. She gets Giroux. She's six to one. And I don't think we've seen the best of her. You know, she's run some great numbers, but she's barely ever been favored. She was... Seven to one last time. She was favored at Charlestown. Why wouldn't she be favored at Charlestown? Uh, she was favored in the Monomoy Girl. She wasn't favored when she broke a maiden. I think we're overlooking society on the outside. And as much as I love Malafat oh. drawn down on the rail, I think the now filly could I, well I, that's, be society. That's and I, I just totally hope we get to see Look, her next year. I, as I well. love Malafat. I mean, I mean she can watch the like field, Malifant, can't she? Right? She's, yeah, she's, she's I totally beat, agree. She scares the heck out of me. Her beat her twice, right? I mean, she's in good form right now and all, but. You know, she's she's not an unbeatable type of filly. Uh, Clary Air, total throw out last time uh, because of what happened in the starting gate. I, I firmly believe that. She was in great form before that, but she's not unbeatable either. She's going to run well. Uh, Nest, you know, I mean, you can make the case. I mean, who did she beat in the Bell Dame? She was 1 to 10 or 1 to 20. Uh, yeah, society, if you go back and watch her races, Charles Towns Oak, and the cotillion, really only two you need to watch. And what you're going to immediately see is going to be like when the gates open, wow, you, aggressively sprinting like a quarter horse almost to the lead. And you're like, how in the heck is this horse going to last? Right. And she gets to the lead. She settles. She relaxes. And then when they start to come to her at one point, you know, she just rebreaks again. And, and opens up and, and wins seemingly with something left, although I know that's often misleading. What's going to happen in here? Search results has speed. But even though, you know, we, we didn't talk to Chad Brown about this, I, I promise you my opinion. Since search results was run down at a mile and an eighth when she hooked up with Latruska early uh, in one of her other races, I think they're concerned a little about her getting the mile and an eighth distance. And I don't think they want any part of going up to hook society on the front end. So I think they'll be content to sit second. And that means society will have a nice, comfortable trip on the front end. I think she'll control the pace. Uh, Wake at midnight will be up there stalking as well. But that's society's game. And given the fact that I think she's going to get the trip and that she's in great form uh, and the name of the game on dirt is speed at six to one, that's me. Race 10 on the card is the Breeders' Cup turf. Let's move on to that. Um, the Europeans have won six of their last seven, and they're going to have some very strong horses in here. But I tell you, I can poke holes in, in most of the, the main European contenders. 
First of all, Rebels Romance, three to one in the morning line. You got the Apple B factor, but the horse has won his last two group ones in Germany. German racing is just not as strong as France, Ireland, and England. You can't take that and look at it and equate it to what you see in the three main countries in Europe. Um, the other uh, Appleby horse in here, Nation's Pride, Randy, it just isn't all that fast. I mean, I know the horse looked very good beating three-year-olds in the Saratoga Derby and the Jockey Club Derby Invitational, but that 96 buyer number doesn't do a whole lot for me. Mistriff, at 11, uh, 11 horse at six to one. Uh, I know uh, soft last time out in the Arc de Triumph, anybody can run poorly in that race, but it's just not in good form right now. Hasn't won in ages all the way back since August of uh, uh, eight, August 18th of 2021. So I, I think that there's, you know, like I said, I'm going to poke a hole. I got some knocks in every single one of, of the main European contenders in here. So if I'm going to go for an American horse, I'm going to go for Warlike Goddess. Um, I love, absolutely loved her last race. I like the way that she was closer to the pace. Now, uh, that was with Lescano aboard. Rosario comes back on her. Um, but her flower ball was a disaster from the trip. She's just so consistent, so good. She's got Bill Mott. And Mott, you know, what a smart trainer he is in here. To run her against boys last time out in the turf classic, to come back against boys again. She certainly has a better chance in this race, I think, than she would have in the mile and a 3 6 16 Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Turf. So I'm a warlike goddess fan in here. I think she's a terrific Philly. She should have won the Eclipse Award last year. She's going to win the Eclipse Award this year when she wins this race, Mandy. Oh, look, I, it, would I be surprised if Warlike Goddess beat the Europeans? No, I would not. I mean, I think you all, you know, all love in the world of Warlike Goddess. Uh, I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, going to run out and buy stock in Charlie Appleby. Uh, but look, <laughs> I went into here deciding. I, I thought I knew who I liked the better of the two Charlie Appleby horses visually, but I knew William Buick was going to have his choice. So I said, let's let's let William Buick make the call here. Which horse is better of the Applebees? Is it Rebels Romance from Germany or is it Nation's Pride? And William Buick has chosen to ride Nation's Pride. And I think it is a good choice. The Buyer speed figure of the Jockey Club Derby, the 96, doesn't bother me in the least. And this is why. Last year, Yabir was shipped over by Appleby to run in the same race, the Jockey Club Derby. And he won it. And he looked pretty good winning it. He got a 94, if I recall, 94 buyer speed figure. And they took him back to England and they brought him back for the Breeders' Cup turf. And as a three-year-old, he took a big step forward when they got him back to the mile and a half turf. And he ran 10 points faster. He ran a 104, coming from way back, nailing the speed at the wire. To me, Nation's Pride was far more visually impressive in the Jockey Club Derby than Yabir was the year before. If you look at Nation's Pride's three races in the United States this year, he's been here and back three different times. So he's accustomed to it. I think he shows a great progression already. In his first start, the Belmont Derby, uh, I hated Frankie DeTore's ride. I thought he rode him very passively early and he got himself shuffled back and he was way too far back. He wound up, you know, four wide on the second turn. Uh, still finished well to be narrowly beaten by Classic Causeway, a horse that he should have been able to outrun in his sleep at a mile and a quarter. Came back in the Saratoga Derby, DeTore off, William Buick on. Uh, he, As you see happen a lot of times with these European riders, when they come to America, especially Ryan Moore, uh, William Buick rode Nation's Pride very aggressively out of the gate, wanting to get him into the race as opposed to his previous start with Detroit and rode him so aggressively that you wondered how he would finish. But it's Charlie Appleby. It's a European horse. He finished very well. He went by Classic Causeway. He won. He was drifting a little bit, you know, wandering in the stretch, probably because he was used so much early. So I was very interested to see if there would be a progression third time out in the Jockey Club Derby. And immediately you knew there was because he put his back to Frankie DeTore. He put DeTore right into the race at the start. Didn't have to urge him at all. He took him right there. And the pace wasn't that slow. And then when he kicked, oh, my gosh. I mean, you talk about a visually impressive kick. 22 and four for the last quarter of a mile, uh, going a mile and a half, uh, 224.14 final time. I think he's going to show another step forward in the Breeders' Cup turf. And I know I've gone over my time allotment here, but I like uh, I like Nation's Pride to win. Yeah, what, what he said, basically. <laughs> wow, okay, that's it. That's simple, huh, Zoe? <laughs> I 
mean, I, I can't really add much more to, to Randy's diatribe there. But yeah, what he said with Nation's Pride, I do like, <laughs> I do like Warlike Goddess, um, I, I have to say. Um, and I hope maybe that Rosario watched the race last time and see that she can be yes. a little bit closer if it's slower. But I will say one thing. I didn't think she had as good a turn as foot last time. I thought maybe she just hung just a little bit rather than produce late. I'm not sure we saw such a blazing turn of foot. Um, when well, she so was, it was that because she was closer early? It was. Yeah, it, it right. was. She got the job done. So, but she's going to be facing a lot stiffer. So I'll just leave that in Rosario's hands. She gets a little bit of a break in weights with 123 pounds. Hey, she's five for five of the distance and two for two at Keeneland. You can't beat that with a stick. Mm -hmm. So it's her race to lose. And we'll just see how she comes up against Nation's Pride, who, yeah, what he said, basically. Good job. Now, well, yeah, thank you. So. Um, <laughs> now, just like we didn't talk about Echo Zulu at all. When we got to the uh, winner sprint, we have not yet uttered the word Mishriff. Despite no, we haven't. the fact the I did, I, got, I, I knocked Mishriff. Oh, you didn't knock him. I'm sorry, then. I'm sorry. I was I was too busy thinking about my diatribe for Nation's Pride. Um, <laughs> the thing, the thing, if Mishriff happens to win this race, and it's John Gosden for Christ's sakes, uh, he will be the richest horse in earnings ever to compete in North America. Primarily because of obviously the Saudi Cup that he won, the inaugural Saudi Cup on dirt. Uh, I just think he's a little over the top, like you said, probably. And uh, so that's why I couldn't go with him. So there. TD and Riders Room and the weekend preview is brought to you by Three Chimneys, the home of Gunrunner. And how about the prodigy of Gunrunner in the Breeders' Cup? Taba in the classic, Echo Zulu in the Philly and Mare Sprint, and Wicked Halo also in that race. Gunite and Cyberknife in the Dirt Mile, Society, we've talked about her, in the Distaff, and Grand Love, who probably set the pace, in the Juvenile Phillies. Sharp Azteca also stands at Three Chimneys. His progeny in the Breeders' Cup. Alma, Alma Rose, let's say that right. Alma Rose in the Juvenile Phillies, and then in the Juvenile Turf Sprint, both Tyler's Tribe and Sharp as a tech. That's a nice murderer's row lineup there for Stallion standing at Three Chimneys. We'll be right back for part two of the weekend preview after this message from Three Chimneys. Here comes Tabor. Tabor in the center of the track with good looking stride. Squares off with Cyberknife. Cyberknife takes the lead. Tabor going with him. These two in a thriller. Cyberknife just in front. And Cyberknife has won the TBG.com Haskell over Tabor. Jack Christopher finished third. The running time, 1 minute 46.24 seconds. Come dream with us at Three Chimneys. And welcome back. We continue with a weekend preview brought to you by Three Chimneys. And we saved the best for last, the Breeders' Cup Classic. I got to tell you, I can't remember the last time I was looking forward to a Breeders' Cup race as much as this. And the reason is obvious because of flight line. Um, you, you know, we are been so spoiled. I know it's he's only raced five times. We've been so spoiled to see this horse. I mean, he's done things that I didn't think I would see in my lifetime. You know, I was fortunate enough as a very small wee child to see Secretariat run in person at the Belmont Stakes. And his race in the Pacific Classic absolutely reminded me of that. Maybe it's blasphemy to say it was as good, but it was certainly the best race I've seen of any horse run since Secretariat in the Belmont Stakes. Uh, by no means would I try to pick against him. Matter of fact, I, I want to get, after I do my little diatribe, I want to, I've set the over under on how many lengths he wins by at six and a half. Quickly, over or under, Randy? And Zoe, you too. Uh, under. under. All right. I made you think about it. You, you know, the reason why it's not 19, of course, is because he's running in a much, much better field than he ran against in the Pacific Classic. I mean, in hindsight, that probably wasn't a very good field. He's not going to win by 19 lengths. But, you know, it's such a treat. From a betting standpoint, I think the way to go is to try to figure out who's going to run second in here. I'm going to take a stand against Life is Good, who probably is the uh, probably be the third or fourth choice in here. There's not a ton of value in throwing him out. I didn't like his Woodward one bit. Um, I, I know Todd Pletcher has given you some reasons why he thinks the race is a little bit better than looks on paper, but I just don't like him coming into the race off, uh, you know, where he was one to a thousand and, you know, wasn't life and death to win or anything like that, but he really did, uh, you know, have a challenge 
on his hands. I've been a Taba fan all along. I think he will run second. I think the second place finishes between the two top three-year-olds in either Taba or Epicenter. Rich Strike, the other three-year-old in there. I don't think he's quite good enough to do it in here. But Taba, when this horse won the Santa Anita Derby in his second lifetime start, that signaled to me that there was absolutely something special here. He took a little bit of a while to regroup, and he finally came into his own and showed what he's all about in the Pennsylvania Derby, which was a dynamite race. Nothing wrong with Epicenter at all. I'm going to play. It's not a ton of value, but that's how I'm going to play the race. Flight line on top and exact is with Taba and Upper Center, Randy. Oh, you know, Bill, after my diatribe in the turf, I want to do like they do in the Senate and the House of Representatives sometimes. I'm, I'm going to cede to Zoe. <laughs> Zoe, why don't you go there first you go. on flight line? <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, you saw Flightline school today, right? Did yep. he not look good? I actually was thinking, judging by the pictures that I've seen of him last week, I'm like, oh, he looks a little lighter than he looked in California. I don't know. He's been working really fast. And I saw him today. And I'm like, oh, throw that out the window. He looks great. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to be tough to beat. I pulled up his thoroughgraph numbers. Negative eight and a half, negative four, negative five, negative five, and a zero when he broke his maiden. Those are just unheard of. Nobody's touching him. I mean, he can go back 10 lengths and he's probably still the best horse in the race. So it's flight line for me of everyone, everything I've seen. I thought Tabor looked terrific schooling today. Just, just like a copper shiny penny by Gunrunner. Uh, he looks like he's put on weight since he got here, to be perfectly honest. Um, he's going to get a great trip from the rail under Mike Smith. Um, he's probably going to be sitting in the catbird seat. It's going to be really interesting to see how fast they go into the first turn. Because you got Tabor pegged by Life is Good, who they slapped the draw reins back on him this week. They took him off at Saratoga because he'd he'd gotten to where he would acquiesce with the rider and just relax. But He's on his game. And when he's wearing his draw reins, he's on his game. He's been super tough to handle. So I think he's going to be as sharp as attack, pun intended. And what are we set, what are we setting the over under at for the opening quarter? 23 uh, over 20 no 23 and 2? No, 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 no. Running down the stretch, straight line, mile and a quarter, straight 22 line. and change is the norm wow. for the Breeders' Cup. Yeah. Like 22 and okay. four, something like this. So I would say, five, obviously, with four. 22 and three. Randy, how far in, how far in, what's after the first quarter mile? Life is good as in front by how much? Where is, where is flight line? After the first quarter, I'll say life is good is uh, in the, Three to four path around the first turn, probably a length and a half ahead of flight line. Okay. When they turn up the back stretch, I think Flavie and Pratt will go to about the eight or nine path going down the backside while life is good is still well off the rail because I think Pratt is going to try like heck to keep flight line from getting too aggressive and putting him too close to life is good. I think he's going to down the back stretch. It doesn't matter how wide you are. I think he's going to be way the hell out to the crown to try to get flight line relaxed. Um, so I think that's, I think they'll go 22 and two, uh, 46 flat, and then probably 109 and change for three quarters of a mile. The, I, I, I didn't want Zoe to have to say what he said for two races in a row. Um, <laughs> no. The, uh, the only scenario that I can see flight line losing, and, and this is possibly a stretch, and, and but he, here it is. Both Life is Good and Flight Line have similar styles in that it's almost like there's a there is a stoplight at the three quarter pole, the six furlong pole, and it and it switches to green when both those horses get to the back stretch. They want to go. You saw it in the Pacific Classic, right? Flight line just literally dragged Pratt to the lead at the three quarter pole. That's when that's when Life is Good wants to go. And I, I could see. Life is good taking off like a bat out of hell at the three-quarter pole because he's very aggressive right now. And I could see flight line getting aggressive with Pratt and wanting to go after this horse. Who is this horse? I'm supposed to be in front. You know, the, 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 these horses are supposed to lay down when I, when, I, when I run up to them. And he's never chased a horse as fast as life is good. 
And if he gets too competitive too early, and if he gets up there head and head with life is good, and they go screaming down the backstretch, and they're because life is good, you know how fast he is. And if they're 10 lengths ahead of the rest of the field and they get to the quarter pole and flight line has put life is good away and he's two lengths in front, but they've gone 109 and one or 109 and two. That's a scenario in which I can see an epicenter or a Taba perhaps, perhaps running down flight line. But interesting, funny, as usual, a conversation with Bob Baffert this morning. Um, you know, I asked him about Taba and how he was coming up to the race and where he thought he would be early in the race and all that. And he said, well, he said, the good news is uh, Taba loves a target. The bad news is he's got to be able to see the target. <laughs> Bob thinks that flight line is, uh, in his words, American Pharaoh as a four-year-old. Right. So it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be a fascinating race. I think it's flight lines race to lose. I, you know, I'd love to see him go off and, as they say, run off the TV. Uh, I think he'll win. But that's the only scenario that I that I could see him with a, maybe a chink in his armor. Zoe, what do you think about that as a, as a former rider? Do you think that Mike Smith is just going to sit there when they pop the latches? Because I he's. He's in the one hole. I can't see him just sitting there and getting covered up. I, I think, think he's, he's going to be. You can tape his... Yeah, I don't. So I don't. Just don't think he's fast enough. And I can't see Smith really sending him to try to go after. I realize what you're saying about the one pulse, but I just don't see Smith. I mean, he doesn't want to get involved with it. It would life is good early. Um, you know, he can sit that comfortable third or fourth trip. What Mike Smith <laughs> told Bob Baffert is that when Table leaves the gate, you think he's going to be in front. And then as soon as he drops his hands back on him a little bit, the horse gets the message right. and he's like, OK, I'm fine. And then he kind of comes back to him and he allows himself to be placed where he wants to be placed. Now, where that is, is up to Mike Smith. So I think he's going to be trying to be as close to life as good. I think life is good is going to go. Mike's going to send, get to the outside of life is good, hold that position, and then flight line will be in the middle of the racetrack, like you said, going down the backside. Interesting. I think okay. he's going to. I think he's going to be a lot closer than you give him credit for because that horse is sharp right now, super sharp wow. for him. Will he be? Will he be second in the early going instead of flight line? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Interesting point. Makes the race even more interesting. <laughs>